Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we now have only 20 minutes or so to have just some questions, answers, and discussions. Um, I will give some opportunity to some of you to raise some questions, but my boss Elizabeth there has asked me to uh, ask questions to the panelists, a bit provocative questions to put, push the discussion a bit further. So I'm going to be a bit provocative, and uh, I will also, um, and uh, I have a, the right to do so because I'm also from one of the BRICS countries. So uh, some of these questions are also self-reflective. Uh, so I'll just ask a few questions, but then again, I'll take some questions for the audience. Some of them, any of you could answer, some of them are specific, so feel free to answer any of them. Um, the first one is, uh, Paolo was talking about that the BRICS offer an alternative development model. Uh, certainly, they have offered a model of growth, but in all the BRICS countries, if there's one thing that brings them in common is inequality. All the countries have extreme major inequalities in their growth process. So how is that um, of a good alternative model for development? Um, secondly, um, again, Paolo, you talked about um, the agenda of the BRICS is, was to reform multilateral institutions. Um, why don't they want to reform the OECD DAC, which is a major, uh, they don't want to even be part uh, of, of, of this uh, multilateral institution where most of development cooperation takes part. Um, um, f then uh, with the issue, this, is goes, this goes particularly to our members who are engaged with the civil society and human rights based perspective. <laughs> Um, the model of South-South Development Corporation, as, as some of you pointed out, uh, refers to things like non-interference, solidarity, no conditionality, all these things we talked about. But then how does that link well with, with the idea of the BRICS countries when providing development assistance, closing uh, a blind eye to other developing countries with serious human rights violations and democratic deficiencies because they don't want to repeat the same approach as the North. How do you balance the human rights and the South-South approach? Um, for, the, for the private sector also, um, again being a bit uh, provocative, many people say now this new research of, of uh, involvement of private sector in development, some people say it's a, it's a resurgence of the neoliberal agenda because ultimately the private sector is about profits. So how can we ensure that actually the interests of the poor are, are going to be taken care of because Traditionally, the private sector has only focused on the interest of the few um, uh, people on top. So um, is this going to reinforce uh, an old neoliberal agenda which has damaged Africa? Uh, and finally, um, um, for, uh, we talked about the BRICS uh, Development Bank as possibly the new uh, mechanism for all these southern providers to provide development cooperation. Will this now overshadow the IPS Trust Fund, which used to be the, one of the primary mechanisms? And how much of the principles of IPSA will be transferred to the BRICS Bank? And what, how, what will be the framework that this bank will, will, will function? And finally, to, to Lee, it's very important, um, about China, as, as China plays a big role in, in development cooperation among the nations of the South. China, you already mentioned that China doesn't feel that it can, it, it can um, um, follow the standards and the systems of the DAC, but can China agree on with the other BRICS brothers and sisters countries uh, on a, some standards of effectiveness of development cooperation, on, on the quality of development cooperation from the South, on potentially a accountability framework for the nations of the South with indicators and regular peer review? Would China be willing to, to, uh, to at least with the nations of the South, with the BRICS uh, partners, to come up with a, with a framework for South-South development cooperation. So those are some questions, uh, but if there's any additional questions from the audience that people would like to throw. Thank you very much. Uh, John Murray, I'm a advisor, a consultant on public policy these days, but in my past I was an academic entirely here in this building, and a diplomat entirely dealing with uh, Russia, India, and China. So it's very interesting for me to be here today, because I'm giving advice to companies, including those from India, of investing in Africa and what they should be doing. And all the countries are very, very excited about the BRIC dimension coming to Africa, through South Africa being linked to the BRICS. And I'm wondering, uh, I don't think perhaps it's possible to answer today, but any ideas from the panel would be interesting. With uh, the, the development, we're talking about BRICS development, 
sometimes people think that BRICS development models would be, uh, it's for the BRICS, and the BRICS development bank would be for development within the BRICS. But presumably, and I think South Africa feels quite strongly about that, that the South African membership of BRICS will, will bring Africa into the picture as well. And, um, and therefore, the BRICS Development Bank can be used for Africa. And there the question arises, and this is what I want to ask, what would be the communication between the BRICS as a body? Would it be bilateral, multilateral? And African countries, in terms of their African countries, have their own priorities, their own uh, development priorities, uh, for example, uh, infrastructure for Africa. We know, for example, China's very interested and involved and helping Africa roll out infrastructure in Africa. But back up to that, we need sustainable development that can link on, utilize that infrastructure. And I'm wondering, sometimes that infrastructure can be tweaked to suit criteria of African countries, or will it only be dictated to by BRICS uh, demands? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Simone Clark, I'm currently a visiting research associate at the University of Pretoria. And we currently conduct a research project on a big variety of capitalism. So one very important part, what Paolo was also saying, that the state's playing an important role in all those economies. So I'm just wondering, when we're now having like a big BRICS summit, how like they are finding common ideas on like how to do, find development, yeah, bringing development into place and actually also like not only from like within business and government and also including um, like civil society organizations as well. So what kind of approach should the state take into all the BRICS developments and also in the com communication uh, within those countries? So it's um, Eduard Westreicher, newly arrived in South Africa from Germany. I'm the new head of the Development Corporation at the German Embassy. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. I just wanted to ask one question, and uh, if I may put forward one remark. I think one or two panelists have been far too modest, saying that uh, there is uh, uh, some sort of uh, ignorance on the few points as far as development cooperation is concerned, as far as uh, human rights and so on are concerned. I just wanted to raise one issue which has not been mentioned at all tonight, and which I admit is having a rather hidden existence. It's what we do have in regional development banks, what is called, for example, the Asian Development Bank, the so-called accountability mechanism. All those panelists around us tonight, representing countries, you're all members of regional development banks. And all these regional development banks have systems such as accountability mechanism at the Asian Development Bank, uh, the inspection panel at the World Bank, and other uh, mechanisms. And these mechanisms very clearly state rights and obligations on member countries. So my point is, Two questions, more or less, is one is when there are new donors, such as China, India, Brazil, Russia, and um, that these donors probably may be interested in knowing what is going on as far as these accountability mechanisms are concerned, because you have signed to them. And second, the, the BRICS, which will be created, the BRICS Bank, which most probably will be created soon, may also ask itself the question, what about the mechanism that it owns and own in its own bank? Thank you. Last question, and then we have the panel response. Hi, good evening, Lydia Cabral, uh, Institute of Development Studies, working with uh, Alex Shanklin, Professor Lee, and also Sergio Shishava from Mozambique on a new research program on China and uh, Brazilian agricultural development. It's described in a brochure included in your pack. So excuse me the chance to <laughs> make a little bit of advertising on our program. Uh, I'd like to take issue with um, um, Paulo Steves' claim 
about the, uh, the BRICS effect. Uh, you argue that uh, Brazilian international engagements are about offering an alternative model of um, economic development, alternative to the um, neoliberal orthodoxy. My question is to what extent the reality of Brazilian cooperation um, in agriculture, in Africa at least, is reflecting such claim. In the agriculture sector at least, um, what we're seeing is that Brazilian cooperation, it's also about triangular partnerships with uh, Japan, Germany, uh, US and the World Bank even. And it's about transferring technologies that serve uh, a particular development model, uh, arguably very strongly linked to um, a capitalist paradigm of, um, of agricultural development linked, uh, inspired in, in, in the US model. So I'm wondering whether it's not Brazilian cooperation, it's just not another case of development taking a, um, being a byproduct of investment, as, as Abdullah Varasha has argued. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I think some, uh, Nissan, you just uh, asked the, uh, the standard accountability. And I would say, uh, if all BRICS uh, uh, would agree to, to, to look at kind of a standard process, procedure for source source cooperation, I would, I would say China would be very willing. Even I can't speak on behalf of China, but I, w I would guess that China will be willing to, uh, to say, yes, let us study. The problem is that when OECD DAG comes, OECD DAG comes to say, look, China, look, look what is your program? Look at your program. Uh, come, you know, we have a lot of experiences you know, for accountability, mutual things, and China might, you know, might stay there to see, look, you know, what does it mean? It's very, you know, this is a kind of, a, kind of a psychological, feeling that China feels very weak, it's not very strong, you know, and, uh, mm, but I would say, and, and I understand what our German friends ask the issue, uh, it's not a question about uh, accountability itself. And uh, China would not reject accountability because uh, even for the mutual accountability, the problem for practical is very difficult for China to implement for its international development cooperation. Why? Because China holds this kind of no conditionality, no interference things. But when you look for the accountability issues, then you have to question the capacities. You have to question a lot of things. Actually, it's interfering. You're going to interfere. And when you're going to interfere, and your no conditionality principles and the no interference principle for a policy would be affected. So it's very controversial in some hall. It's difficult, practice is very difficult. Secondly, and with multilateral development institution. China is a member. China is the second largest member of the World Bank. China is also a member of a many, many regional banks, like in, include the AFD, AFD here. So when the international, multinational agencies start looking for accountability issues, but that does not mean China interfering in other countries' uh, affairs. Therefore, China is going to sign this to see, of course, you know, we can we contribute the money, so you're going to take responsibilities on me. But if you ask China itself as a single sovereignty to deal with South Africans, to say, look, this is my money. You have to be careful because my people behind looking at the money. This is what British, Germans, American, you know, the way. So I would say accountability is not an issue of accountability, it's the issue of politics. It's the politics of international relation, it's politics of everything. So it's very difficult to see the human rights, it's just a human rights issue. So nobody would with the long the people suffering, hungry, torture. No, China will not support that. But when you deal with these kind of issues, with dealing with a sovereignty state, then you can't say that we cannot give you the money to Zimbabwe. You can't say this because this is you, you can't this you know, this largely is not issue of human rights. It's an issue of you're dealing with the country who's who is the president still in power and you can't say it's illegal or legal because this, we, we can't define this. And you are, you are people define. If you're going to change uh, president, we still deal with this president. You know, this is the ways 
practically I would see that a lot of issues when China deal with this international development project, and a lot of blames and uh, excuse blames uh, for these issues. So. so Silvia has asked if he could go second, so I've got to give to him. Thank you. I would like to raise, firstly, three points. One of them is about accountability. I'm a member of the Social Council of the Inter-American Development Bank in Brazil. And I know very well the accountability instruments that they have. But we have made, as Policy Institute, the development NGO, where I belong from, some evaluations. And this coming out from these evaluations, we need to recognize that the bank is a bank and the governments are the clients. So, if the government has accountability, uh, accountable instruments to evaluate the projects, they are ver very well welcome and they are, are well used. Otherwise, the, the international banks doesn't have the capacity to implement it. Né? And we have had several case studies on that. Né? And I wish I could say something better than this. <laughs> the second point is about violation of human rights. I don't know a single country that doesn't violate human rights. And I would like to, to say more. The, I think that is in the capitalist DNA the difficulty to universalize human rights. So. We, we are facing challenges not only to respect human rights, but to change some kind of development models that has implicitly inside them that kind of bias. And finally, talking about South-South cooperation, we are dealing as civil society entities mostly with the intention of interchanging experiences in building autonomy and the capacity of civil society to play their role in our societies uh, related to governments. We have had now in Cape Town three days uh, of discussion with GGLN, which is a, an African network that deals with local governance, and Logolink, which is an international network that deals with the same issue. Uh, interchanging experiences and discussing how to improve better our capacity, our role as civil society entities uh, to implement accountability, transparency, but more than that, the capacity to introduce citizenship in the center of the decision-making processes uh, at the level of public policies. Of course, we have a lot of limits on that. Uh, the limits are structural, but the limits are also about our capacity to implement projects, our financement, our uh, accumulate knowledge. Yeah. But anyway, we, f we find that uh, if we cannot play that role, we will not acquire uh, uh, um, new policies that can change this reality. And we can recognize, at least in Brazil, that all the acquirances in social policies that we have had, né, civil society has had a, a, a role in pressing governments to implement new policies, very important. Thank you. Obviously, I cannot uh, talk on behalf of the uh, government of India. Uh, but uh, I don't see any kind of inherent contradiction between um, South -South, promoting South-South learning and being non-interference. Um, I think what has uh, the experience, uh, what has been the experience uh, with many other uh, international development cooperation uh, is the absence of uh, critical dialogue. And instead of engaging in critical dialogue, um, I think the, the answer, uh, uh, the, the attempt to find answer was uh, through military or uh, sanction, uh, economic sanction. Um, 
you, you uh, give me any example where uh, economic sanction has um, really brought about social change or political changes in any of the countries in the past 30, 40, 40, 50 years. It hasn't. So uh, the instrument of sanctions or instrument of uh, military engagement uh, is not the answer. And, and uh, learning as the basis for social change, uh, that's the spirit uh, should be, should be uh, promoted here. It may sound a bit uh, uh, ideological, but that's what we are watching for. Uh, that how uh, our governments and the BRICS as an entity uh, brings out an alternative paradigm of learning and cooperation. Uh, otherwise, otherwise uh, we, we as a civil society has to take the same position that we have taken for many international uh, cooperation. Just to remind one thing uh, that it took almost, uh, uh, for World Bank, it took almost 45 years to come up with the first information disclosure policy. So um, we are talking about an entity which has not even taken, uh, which has not even born. So, uh, but, but, but as, 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 as uh, kind of concerned citizen, uh, we must be aware about that and right from the beginning should be pushing for all kind of accountability and transparency uh, mechanisms. So that's a kind of way of response uh, to, to uh, what you have uh, saying. So I think there were, there were three questions that uh, I was asked to, to address. The first one is obviously, and, and you mentioned the issue of uh, the private sector is all about profits. Uh, I think uh, there are two points to that question. The first one is, uh, is the investment profile of the private sector coming into Africa uh, dominated by the objective of profit, or is it, uh, does it have a specific developmental mindset? Of course it's about profit, but I think there are developmental priorities that come through. And I want to give you a few examples. The first one is uh, a case study around the Tata group of companies. 67% of the Tata group of companies are owned by corporate social investment trusts. Uh, and so essentially 67% of the company uh, and the profits of that company Go, to, go towards corporate social investment initiatives. The second one is to look at the impact of the pharmaceutical sector from India into Africa. If you look at the top uh, five pharmaceutical companies from India that have invested into Africa and the concomitant implication of those investments, we've started to see a significant reduction in terms of generic medication uh, into various sectors, especially into the public healthcare sector in various parts of Africa. And today, four out of the five large Indian pharma companies supply a significant amount of antiretrovirals to government, and that has resulted in significant reduction in terms of the cost of medication. And that obviously has a developmental agenda to it. The third one is to really look at this concept of social entrepreneurship. And we're starting to see uh, a lot of examples of social entrepreneurship uh, becoming key in terms of the investment profile from various BRIC countries coming into Africa. And even uh, amongst African countries, look at the uh, impact of M-Pesa in Kenya uh, and the impact of that in terms of agriculture, in terms of rural development. Uh, and the impact of M-Pesa is one example of so many others. Uh, I'll go back to the group of MBA students that I took and we visited Dr. Devi Shetty, who's known as the, the Henry Ford of medicine. And he provides uh, health care uh, at a fraction of the cost uh, to various Indians in India. Uh, and there's a discussion now in terms of taking some of those healthcare operations and bringing them to various parts of Africa. And that will fundamentally change the healthcare sector. Look at the makeup of the healthcare sector in South Africa. You've got a public healthcare system that's ailing and falling apart. You've got a private healthcare system that's astronomical and out of the reach of almost everybody, even individuals in the middle class. And there's a, so there's a significant opportunity for someone to play in the middle sector. And so Indian healthcare providers provide a perfect vantage point to do that, and the discussion is to be able to do that. So yes, uh, the private sector is about profits to an extent, but I think we're starting to see the developmental impact uh, of the private sector uh, in Africa. And the second one was this concept of the uh, agenda of the BRICS summit, uh, and what's going to be on the agenda is, is Africa a key component of that agenda? Uh, we often hear the discourse among analysts uh, about South Africa's deservedness to be part of the, uh, the BRICS grouping. Jim O'Neill has spoken about it extensively. Uh, and I think there's a rationale behind why South Africa was invited to be part of the BRICS discourse. Uh, despite the fact that from a GDP perspective, we don't compare. From a population perspective, we don't compare. And I think it's because of our role and our relationship in Africa. Uh, and when you look at the current agenda that's going to be discussed next week, the host country is responsible for the agenda that's set. 
And when you look at how the South African government has put together that agenda, Africa is a key component. We're going to be having a number of African heads of state who will serve as observers at the BRICS summit. Uh, and also a number of the agenda items are focusing on Africa's development. And the South African government has been very good at doing that and putting Africa uh, as a key priority on that. And then the last two, I think the first one is this concept of the BRICS Development Bank and the impact. And when you look at the impact of development banks, especially from China, look at the, the China Development Bank and the Export Impact ba Import Bank of China, they together accounted for 110, mil 110 billion US dollars of, of development-related funding in 2009-2010. That's more than the funding that the World Bank put together in that year. And that's sizable and significant. And then finally, uh, and this is a, a personal bugbear, when we start talking about uh, policy and policy discourse in Africa, one of the key issues that often come about is this issue of beneficiation and the concept of minerals being beneficiated in Africa. Look at the diamond sector as an example. The bulk of diamonds come from Africa, yet 93% of diamonds are polished in India. Uh, and the question often uh, is asked is to why are all of these diamonds polished in India? Because India has created the requisite enabling environment for polishing those diamonds. And one of the discussions we had at the India-Africa partnership two years ago was how do we create uh, the requisite environment in certain African countries to be able to have diamonds polished here. And out of that was a decision uh, where the Indian government committed to open up diamond training centers in Namibia and Angola. Those are starting to function and we're starting to see the impact of that. And so for me, I think uh, what really must come out of this discussion is a more active role from, as you rightly say, from civil society to play a key role in terms of putting the developmental priorities on the agenda of the BRICS, because I think that's when we'll start seeing the real impact in the forthcoming summits. Thanks. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the questions. I, will, I guess I, I can skip the, the Development Bank uh, debate and the, all the accountability debate on, on the, the, the question of the bank. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nissan, for, for your question. I, I, it's an opportunity to, to make um, propaganda and advert. Uh, uh, we just issued in the BRICS Policy Center a uh, report uh, that we made together with Oxfam on inequalities in BRICS countries. Uh, I, I guess it is in the website, right? Uh, uh, it is uh, available uh, at the website. Uh, and one, one important thing, the first important thing I, we should see is that uh, OECD own record is not that great in the last 10 years, uh, at like, uh, in the last 20 years actually. Uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the inequality growth uh, uh, within the OECD area as well. Uh, the inequality in South Africa, Brazil, Russia, China and India uh, was already quite significant. Uh, but we, what, what we have to see I, I, I do think that we have to see two things. Uh, it's not a compliment. It's not an, uh, uh, a compliment to Brazil, but Brazil in the last decade was uh, the only BRIC country that actually reduced inequality uh, in one way or another, with the with less growth actually. Uh, the second thing that we should, uh, 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 I guess, we should recognize is that it, it was exactly this new liberal model that was fostered after the Cold War, the one which was responsible for the growth of inequality all, along, all, 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 all over the world. Uh, there is a sociologist, a German sociologist, that I, I, I do think that everybody knows, uh, Ulrich Beck, that it, uh, uh, Ulrich, 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 Ulrich Beck calls globalization as a process of Brazilianization of the world. Because after globalization, the level of inequality in the world would be the same as, as it was in Brazil. It's not a compliment for Brazil to have uh, uh, its own uh, uh, name uh, calling such a process, but it is a fact. Uh, the level of inequality grew, uh, grew a lot uh, during, uh, during this time. It's not a, a privilege of BRICS countries. Uh, for the BRICS countries' uh, 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 responsibilities, what I have to say, there is, there is two things. Uh, in terms of Brazil, the level of inequality is uh, decreasing the last, at least in the last 10 years. Uh, and the second thing uh, is that those countries are actually fighting poverty. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, the inequality is growing, but they all, uh, uh, at the same time, they are fighting poverty. And 
have some of them uh, having good results. I'm not, I'm not defending this the BRICS, uh, BRICS countries developing the developing model. I'm just saying that these countries, in one way or another, they navigate throughout uh, uh, liberalization and create alternative models. Those models can be worse. Uh, uh, I rather prefer living in Denmark uh, uh, if I could. Uh, uh, for for me, it's a it's it's a best uh, it's the best society. But anyway. Uh, uh, those countries, they created a, 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 an alternative model for globalization, for liberalism, and this model can be uh, 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 emulated uh, throughout the world. Uh, the second thing uh, regarding multilateral institutions and the OECD, that's for Brazilians' point of view, it's a, it's, a, it's a simple question. Brazil is not part of the OECD uh, uh, <coughs> and refused to, to get in uh, several times, I guess. Uh, uh, so in that sense, uh, Brazil, I, I, I do think that Brazil had to engage uh, with the post boson uh, process, uh, uh, as Brazil is trying to engage with, uh, with post MDGs uh, and with the, oh God, I, I cannot say that in English, uh, sustainable development goals, yeah, SDGs, yes. Uh, in Portuguese it's the other way around, sorry about that. Uh, 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 as Brazil is trying to engage with uh, SDGs and MGDs, uh, DGs, uh, I do think that Brazil should engage and discuss uh, 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 the po post bosan framework. What I do think that Brazil could not do is, tr is accept uh, uh, a framework that is being baked or is being cooked uh, within OECD. Uh, which at same point, uh, uh, at sometimes it seems to be what is happening. Uh, as as far as I heard, and I just heard that uh, for several uh, sources, uh, what happened, uh, what, is, what what was happening, uh, is that uh, 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 DAC uh, and the OECD were trying to bring BRICS on, on board uh, to uh, make them uh, make them uh, uh, um, accountable of some rules that BRICS countries didn't create for themselves. So that makes no sense uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, the third uh, uh, point regarding human rights and self-self uh, 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 cooperation. <coughs> uh, again, I'm, I'm speaking as a, as a private citizen. I, I do think that this is an important question. As a Brazilian citizen, I'm not happy uh, uh, with the fact, and I said that in Brasilia uh, some time ago in front of the Brazilian authorities, I'm not happy with the, with the fact that Brazilians cooperating with Zimbabwe. Uh, uh, and that's a problem for me as a citizen. Uh, uh, in that sense, I do think that uh, since we are actually discussing in Brazil, or we are going to discuss in Brazil a, a general law for international cooperation, I do think that we should have some kind of a council uh, 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 with civil society uh, uh, seats uh, to discuss that, that, uh, that th those matters. Because when, in one way or another, is a, is a, is a, a, a public money that is uh, going to, to fund this thing. Uh, so in, in it, 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 it will be perhaps a, a, a way to make uh, uh, governmental agencies or cooperation agencies accountable uh, uh, at, at least for the Brazilian uh, uh, citizenship. Uh, <clears throat> finally, regarding the, the, the um, uh, uh, regarding, sorry, there, there are two, two last questions. I will try to be fast. Uh, regarding the commonalities among BRICS, I, I, I don't, do not think that I got your question well, uh, but I don't think in terms of development cooperation, BRICS countries, they have uh, uh, lots of commonalities. I, I, I think those are uh, uh, very heterogeneous uh, 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 experiences. Uh, I do think that Brazil and South Africa might have some more commonalities. Brazil, South Africa, and perhaps India might have some uh, more commonalities uh, than uh, we have uh, with China, for instance. Uh, and I do think that we cannot think about BRICS in terms of in a homogeneous terms. Uh, perhaps the most funny and uh, uh, interesting definition of BRICS uh, that I heard uh, uh, in the last period was that the fact that BRICS uh, was actually an euphemism to designate China. Uh, 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 in a way, the asymmetries within BRICS are so big that this, is, this might be not entirely true, but at least makes sense. Uh, uh, finally, uh, Lydia's question about Brazilian uh, cooperation in Africa. This is, uh, uh, we have a, a saying in Brazil about that. It's a, this, this is a casinha de caboclo. It's a armadilha. Trap. This is a trap. Uh, you know that much better than me, so uh, uh, I will answer, answer that wrongly, I guess. But I, what I was trying to say is that 
uh, <coughs> it's not that Brazil is exporting its own model of, of development cooperation. But since those countries uh, are actually, uh, since those countries uh, stepped in uh, uh, the international development field, they are offering uh, alternatives to the only, uh, to, the, the, to the liberal model, which, were, which was uh, uh, 10 years ago, the only model available. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, if this process goes on, uh, those countries might choose between conditionalities, between different kinds of conditionalities and different kind of, kinds of business. I'm not sure, oh sorry, I'm sure this is not good because we, w what we are going to see is not a new framework, but it is a race to the bottom. Uh, and a race to the bottom is not good for anyone, uh, uh, any intermediate country or uh, any medium income country or uh, uh, to any uh, 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 poor country. It might be good for the powers, for the great powers. Uh, but in a sense, uh, what, I, what, I, what I can see uh, in Brazilian development cooperation in the field of agriculture, and that, that, that's more a research question than a, a statement, uh, my main interest is to see how uh, the Brazilian model uh, of Embrapa uh, is uh, emulating other models or uh, is inspiring other models in other countries. Uh, and that's not a development model per se, but it is a kind of uh, 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 institutional copying, that makes sense in English, uh, uh, institutional reproduction. Yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, for good and for, and, and, for, uh, and for worse. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists and all the contributions. Extremely interesting uh, points of view.